Thank you for your support of Hope Community. We rely upon the gifts, the contributions, the tithes and offerings of God's people. We do not pass an offering basket, as you know. Uh, we have the contribution box strategically located, so you cannot miss it as you walk in. Uh, we believe Hope Community practices giving away one out of every ten dollars that comes into the church is given away to God's kingdom work around the world. We believe that tithing is a principle. It's one that we practice. It's one that we challenge all God's people to practice. Giving away 10% of their income to kingdom work. Thank you. Thank you for your support of Hope Community. Can you tell us a little bit more about 40 Days for Life? Oh, sure. 40 Days, it's not, a, it's not a church thing. I'm just putting it out there so people can find out about it. The best thing to do is to go to the, the website that's listed there. No luck. I <laughs> what 40 Days for Life is starting September 28th. I believe it's September 28th. Uh, starts, uh, uh, I think it's the 28th. Yes. They start 40 days of prayer for unborn children. You can pray in different venues. One of them is the Alpha Center, either at 7 a.m. or 8 a.m. in the morning. Another venue for the more adventurous. Uh, praying on the sidewalk outside of Planned Parenthood. Uh, not confronting people, just praying. Uh, but there are all sorts of opportunities to be involved. They have a kickoff, I think, a week from Tuesday. They have a movie uh, over at, uh, or a kickoff over at John the 23rd Catholic Church. I'm planning on being there. It's a week from Tuesday night. I, but go to the website, find out more about it. Does that help, Sue? Thank you for that question. What's the name of the website? It's on the uh, Hope Opportunities. It's kind of a long name, but it's on Hope Opportunities. Yeah, take one of those home with you. Uh, if you have any other questions, give me a call, send me an email, and uh, shoot me a text, and I'll try to answer your questions as best I can. We are this at this time. We are going through a series on wisdom, and we are looking at the life of Solomon whom the Bible identifies as the wisest person who ever lived. King Solomon of Israel, the Bible identifies as the wisest person who ever lived. And we have developed or have been developing a definition of wisdom based upon the life of Solomon. The definition begins with conforming to the truth. Solomon, when he became king, God came to Solomon in a dream and said, Ask anything of me at all, and I will give it to you. Solomon said to God, I am just a child. He understood the truth. He understood reality. And he conformed to that reality. Lord, he said, I need help. Our world is packed with people in desperate need of God's help, but too proud to ask. So the number one definition of wisdom is conforming to the truth. Solomon understood how immature and how much help he needed. Number two definition is recognizing value and putting value on display. God, Solomon understood that he needed God's wisdom, and so he asked God for wisdom. And when he received it, he didn't hide it. He put it on display. You can read about it in the first book of 1 Kings. Putting value on display. Recognizing value. Wise people can differentiate between what's valuable and what's useless. What's valuable and what is not valuable. Our culture has a problem with that. Our culture puts value upon things that are not valuable. Wisdom recognizes true value and puts it on display. The third definition of wisdom, as we looked at this last week, is, it is the fear. It begins with the fear of the Lord. Tuesday night at our sermon discussion group, I got critiqued. said, Dan, you didn't do a very good job of describing fear of the Lord, because in our culture today, people don't want to be afraid of anything. Of course, as we talked last week, because we've lost our fear of the Lord or abandoned our fear of the Lord, we have become afraid of everything. We even take our shoes off before we get on an airplane. Can't get much sillier than that. I told you several times when I was on the airport in Beijing 
and I was going through security, and I asked, do I need to take off my shoes? And these Chinese people looked at each other, and they, they talked amongst themselves, and then they turned to me and they laughed at me. Oh, no, don't take your shoes off. That's silly. But because we have abandoned our fear of the woods, look, uh, several years ago, I climbed up uh, Long's Peak. Eddie, you've climbed Long's Peak, but how many have climbed Long's Peak? Yeah. And as you get up in the boulder field, and if you go across the boulder field towards the east, and if you're not paying attention, there's a little bit of a drop, 1,500 feet straight down. It just, and you, as I was going over there, and, and the wind tends to blow at your back, and as I was going over there, and I got closer to the edge, my knees got weaker, and I became more fearful. And that fear was a very good thing. My son was telling me in, in uh, officer candidate school, they dumped him in the field with a compass and maps and coordinates that they had to find. They had to find eight coordinates. And he had six hours to do it in. And one of the guys, a guy who had been previously in Afghanistan as a enlisted man and who'd been in an IED explosion, and apparently was having some residual impact from that even months after. He was great big guy, Ben said, about six foot seven inches. He was going through some brush and stepped off the edge of about a 20 foot cliff. And he had a concussion. And that concussion stuck with him and he had to be recycled for health reasons. And they think that concussion was a result, not just of dropping off that cliff, but of being in that IED explosion that improvised explosive device in Afghanistan. But you see, the fear of that cliff, you know, it's not the fall that hurts. It's the sudden stop at the end. <laughs> the fear of the cliff was a good thing. The fear, I got to sit in Steve Howard's courtroom a couple of weeks ago and uh, kind of witnessed him uh, sentencing people. Uh, it is the fear of getting a DUI, driving, while under the influence that keeps people from driving when they're impaired. That fear is a very good thing. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about the fear of the Lord. Wisdom begins with the fear of the Lord. Finally today, not finally today, but today we're looking at another part of the definition of wisdom, the ability to explain concepts. In the Bible, in 1 Kings, you can read about Queen of Sheba. Now, we don't really know where Sheba is. We think it probably was in the area of modern-day Ethiopia, but we're not sure. Queen of Sheba came to visit Solomon. The Bible tells us that Solomon could answer all of her questions and explain them to her. I have many times been in a classroom setting with a professor or someone like that who could give me an answer that made no sense to me. Many times I give people answers that make no sense to them. I can give them an answer, but I can't help them understand. Wisdom is the ability to help someone else understand a complex or new concept. Solomon had that ability to explain con uh, complex concepts. Well, Solomon's wisdom made him a very, very wealthy man. It occurred to me last week when I told the story of the, of the, the TV commercial of a guy on the deserted island that had three wishes, and there was the genie there, and he wished for the hot rod, and he wished for the cheerleaders, and then he wished for a bag of M&Ms, and the M&Ms show up and ask him why he didn't wish for a boat, because he's stranded on a desert island. But it occurred to me that if I could have one wish, if I had a genie for one night, I would ask every morning, I get the Wall Street Journal delivered to my house, I would ask that every morning it was tomorrow's Wall Street Journal. <laughs> you realize how quick you could become wealthy if you just had tomorrow's newspaper today. That'd be cool. <laughs> Well, Solomon was wise, and he created huge wealth. Not only did he create wealth, but he was a job creator. Created a huge amount of jobs. Everybody was doing well. We need Solomon today. We need job creators. We need wealth creators. But this is how Solomon did it. Now, Israel, uh, even though it's a coastal land, 
Israel never has been, never had been seafaring people. As Israel expanded under David and Solomon, they controlled all the way up to the two rivers, the Tigris, Euphrates rivers, and all the way down to Egypt. And Israel controlled the trade routes called the Spice Roads back then. Later became known as the Silk Roads. And if you controlled those, as the traders came through, for instance, the city of Damascus, you could put a tax on everybody that came in, and you could tax their goods. Of course, there was always a balance to that. If you taxed them too heavily, they wouldn't come into Damascus. They'd go somewhere else. But if you taxed them lightly, and if you made Damascus a great place to come and visit, it was a great way to make wealth. Well, Solomon controlled, David and Solomon controlled a great deal of land trade, but they had no impact on the sea trade in the Mediterranean Sea. Right next to Israel was a Phoenician city called Tyre. The king of Tyre, a man named Piram, who was David's friend, became Solomon's business partner. Not only now could Solomon trade on land, but he could trade by sea. He could put goods on sea with the king of Tyre, and he could send it to Spain and to Italy. And Solomon began not only to import cedar and horses and chariots, but he would export them as well, not only over land, but over sea. And Solomon had mines, copper mines and iron mines, and he could export that stuff over land and over sea. He became so very wealthy because he had this wisdom. He was a wealth creator extraordinaire. Not only that, but he made Jerusalem a center of learning and knowledge. As I mentioned to you, the Queen of Sheba came. People came from all over, and they brought gifts, and they made business contacts, and trade was developed as people came to hear and to sit under Solomon's wisdom and his tutelage, and to hear him explain complex concepts. Solomon was a wealth creator extraordinaire because of the wisdom that was a gift from God. But we need to pick up the story. I wish the story of Solomon was just one success, one champion, one great step after another. But if you know the life of Solomon, that was not the case. And today we begin to look kind of on the downside of it. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 11. 1 Kings chapter 11, beginning in the first verse. And uh, will you stand with me as today, as together we honor the word of the Lord. 1 Kings chapter 11, beginning in verse 1. King Solomon, however, loved many foreign women besides Pharaoh's daughter. Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites. They were from nations about which the Lord had told the Israelites, you must not intermarry with them, because they will surely turn your hearts after their gods. Nevertheless, Solomon held fast to them in love. He had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines, and his wives led him astray. As Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods. And his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God, as the heart of David his father had been. He followed Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Molech, the detestable god of the Ammonites. So Solomon did evil in the eyes of the Lord. He did not follow the Lord completely, as David his father had done. On the east hill of Jerusalem, Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the detestable god of Moab, and for Molech, the detestable god of the Ammonites. He did the same for all his foreign wives who burned incense and offered sacrifices to their gods. The Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. Lord Jesus, our prayer is in these last few minutes, you alone might be exalted. May be seated. Following false gods leads to trouble. 
We'll see that in Solomon's life the next couple of weeks. But following false gods leads to trouble. The Lord had given uh, Solomon great wisdom, and he became a wealth creator extraordinaire, and he created jobs and industry and opportunities. And he built, with the king of Tyre, he built a fleet that went out and it went on a three-year journey. And it, what a, I bet you people lined up to be a part of that trading. Guys would, would, would volunteer just to be a cabin boy and go see the world on that fleet and, and travel the world, and they brought back all sorts of exotic things. Yet in his old age, Solomon honored false gods. He followed Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Moloch, the detestable god of the Ammonites. So Solomon did evil in the eyes of the Lord. He built temples for foreign deities on the hills overlooking Jerusalem. Solomon lost his devotion to God. Following false gods leads to trouble. Now, very few of us have built temples. If you go to Asia today or many parts of the world, you will in many homes find a kind of temple thing, a, an altar that's built in the house or developed in the house uh, that, that people honor or worship or however you want to phrase it. But very few of us build temples or worship foreign idols or foreign deities, our false gods are different. Uh, they are our stock portfolios, or lack thereof. They are our pension plan. They are our careers. They are our political persuasion. They are our sports team. They are fashion. They are education. All of these things are good in and of themselves, but when we place them ahead of the Lord God, the giver of wisdom, it will lead you and I into trouble. Solomon followed false gods. And coincidentally, he began to undercut his partner, his trading partner, Hiram. Uh, the king of Tyre had provided Solomon all the cedar and all the gold and all the timber that Solomon needed to build the temple of God and to build the palace of Solomon and to build palaces for his queen. 700 lives. Now, I know those were primarily, you know, those, those are military alliances and those are political alliances and those are business alliances. 700. Somewhere he lost wisdom. Somewhere he went off the deep end. And so Solomon had this great deal going with the king of Tyre and a trade for all of the resources of the king of Tyre. Solomon gave him 20 cities. 20 cities. And the king of Tyre went to look at the cities and he says, what's this, my brother? What is this you have given me? These cities are ghettos. These are horrible. And he called it the land of good for nothing. Solomon undercut his best trading partner. Solomon's policies began to raise up in his empire uh, opposition. One of, one of the guys uh, who was an uh, op op opponent of Solomon was a gentleman named Rezim. He was kind of a Robin Hood in the area of Damascus. And he, he created trouble in that area with trading area. Uh, and where the caravans would come through, and he would loot the caravans, and he would cause trouble for Solomon. And Solomon wasn't able to protect the caravans, so when you can't do that, you can't raise taxes from them. And there was another young man who was a survivor of Edom. When King David, Solomon's father, had come in and destroyed the Edomites, he annihilated most of the people, but one of the princes survived. And later in life, he began to raise up the Edomites against the heavy hand of Saul. Because when you fail to follow the Lord with devotion, you begin to be a tyrant to others. You begin to take advantage of others. You see yourself falsely. Not only did the Lord raise up rebels against Solomon, but Solomon sought to kill a man named Jeroboam, who was one of his very best officials, why? 
because a prophet had gone to Jeroboam and said, Jeroboam, God's going to divide the country, and he's given you ten of the twelve tribes of Israel. Solomon learned of this, and he decided the way to solve this is not to go and repent before God, but to kill off Jeroboam. Because when you fail to follow the Lord wholeheartedly, wisdom begins to seep away. Solomon was not fully devoted to God. I love what the scriptures say, that Solomon loved his wives. Now, that's a very unique term in the Old Testament. Outside of the book of the Song of Solomon, which Solomon wrote about one or more of his wives, it's a wonderful erotic book if you want to read some biblical, what's the word I'm looking for? Romantis. Romant, I'll say romantic. But it's, it's more than romantic. It's right there in the Bible. But outside of the Song of Solomon, there are about six references in the entire Old Testament to a husband loving his wife. And one of them is right here. Solomon loved his wives. And his wives must have loved that. Because so often women were treated as property. But Solomon didn't. He honored them. The problem is he honored them ahead of his devotion to his Lord. Solomon no longer appears desperate for God's help. You know, a little success is a dangerous thing. And Solomon had much more than just a little success. He was no longer desperate for God's wisdom. He had ample wisdom of his own. He could run the country. He didn't need God's help anymore. Pride, Solomon wrote, comes before the fall. Solomon's huge success clearly resulted in pride in himself. Solomon was not fully devoted to God. And we in the West have drifted away from our devotion to God. We in the West, the Western civilization, is no longer devoted to God. You know, in, in America, presidential words, presidents, especially on prepared speeches, they exemplify, they reflect back to us who we are. For instance, at the end of the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln in the second inaugural wrote this, and you can read it today in the Lincoln Memorial. Lincoln uh, said in the second inaugural about the North and the South, both read the same Bible and pray to the same God. Each invokes his aid, that is God's aid against the others. The prayers of both could not be answered. The prayers of neither have been answered fully. World War II, on D-Day, I mentioned this last week, Franklin Roosevelt came on the, on the radio and everybody was listening because the D-Day invasion was announced and people were listening to hear what their president would say to them. President Roosevelt, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, listen, he said this, join with me in prayer. And then he prays, Almighty God, our sons this day have set upon a mighty endeavor, a struggle to preserve our republic, our religion, our civilization. See, the presidents reflect back reality to us. They, they hold up a mirror to us. And at the most recent inaugural, President Obama did the very same thing. He has said, we are a nation of Christians and Muslims, Jews and Hindus and non-believers. He was absolutely on the money accurate because we in the West have drifted away from our devotion to the God of the Bible. Oh, not just America, the European Union, the Pope, and uh, March 3rd of 2007 said Europe is headed for oblivion because their refusal to acknowledge God's place in their land. The European Union failed to mention God in their Berlin Declaration, or even mention Europe's Christian roots. Like Solomon, the West has drifted away from devotion to God. Here's the question I have for you today. Are you fully devoted to God? Are you fully devoted to God? 
Devotion to God does not depend upon the culture in which you live. You do not have to live in a right culture to be devoted to God. In fact, the opposite may be more true. I have been reading a book entitled Jesus in Beijing. It's written by Dave Aikman, who at one time was the Time Magazine correspondent in China. And Dave Aikman has, uh, uh, has researched Christianity in China, and he's written this wonderful, wonderful book, Jesus in Beijing. And he talks about all the underground seminaries in China. And the estimates are there's a couple of thousand of them that are illegal seminaries. And he talks about visiting one, and it's in a Christian village in China. A Christian village in China. Is there a Christian city in Fort Collins in, in, in America? There's a Christian city in China where everybody works together to keep the seminary hidden. Everybody plugs in their electricity at certain times to the building with the seminary in it so that they can't identify that they're using a lot of electricity. People buy extra food and take the food to the seminary, and, and people help out in all sorts of different ways. This seminary has only 68 students, just about the same number of young men as young women. And Dave Aikman was at one of the afternoon worship services, and they came in, and uh, there was just a little platform up front, but all the students were sitting on baton mats. And the boys were on one side in neat rows of five or six, and the girls were on the other side in neat rows of five or six. And here's how the worship service happened. A row would get up, they'd jump up, and they'd come up front, and they'd lead everybody in a worship song. And then they would run down, and then a row from the girls' side would jump up, and they'd run up front, and they'd lead everybody in the worship, and then they would go, and this rotation happened as they rotated through, and that's how they worshiped. They didn't have worship leaders, it was participation. The Chinese leaders claim that the reason the church is so impactful in China is because of persecution. Because they do not live in a nation that honors the Lord. The Christians are more powerful and more impactful. Dave Aikman was sitting in that worship service and he listened to the students sing this song, China, China, rise up. Rise up to share the gospel because God loves you. Then because they saw that Dave Aikman was there. You know, white guys kind of stick out in China. We have these big noses that stick. That's what they call us, big nose. Big noses that stick out. And we're kind of... We, ben and I were walking in Tiananmen Square last August and people came to Ben and grabbed the applaud here. Grabbed him and they wanted a picture of their daughter with Benjamin. <laughs> And she was terrified. I think many of you have seen the picture. And Ben had his hand kind of around her, but he says, oh no, I didn't touch her. <laughs> it just looked good in the picture. But because that American was there, then the students in that seminary sang this song. America, America, rise up. Rise up to share the gospel because God loves you. Are you and I fully devoted to God like those seminary students in China. Wisdom, God's wisdom is available to you and to me. Karen, thank you for your prayer this morning when you talked about accessing in your prayers and your meditation, accessing God's wisdom. That wisdom is available. Too often, folks, we rely upon our standard operating procedures. We say, what's the right thing to do here? Rather than asking, what's the God thing to do here? Solomon, early in his life, he wanted to do the God thing. Later in his life, he wanted to do the politically correct thing. And because he had all these wives, he built on the mountains on east of Jerusalem, he built little temples for each of them to worship in it and burn incense to. He displeased God. He alienated the people. And in the weeks to come, we'll see the tragedy that resulted because Solomon failed to stay devoted to God. My friends, wisdom, God's wisdom, is available to those who's full, who are fully devoted to the Lord as their God, as their Savior, as their Heavenly Father, 
as their friend, as their king, as their master and teacher. Let us be fully devoted to God and receive the great wisdom God has for each one of us. Lord Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you for your church all over the world and for the ways that we act in wisdom. Lord, forgive us for our foolish acts and our self-centeredness and our short-sightedness. Lord, give us your wisdom because wisdom is available. God's wisdom is available to those who seek God, who honor God, and ask. Lord, let us be wise. Let us not be convinced by the arguments of a materialistic world. Open our eyes that we can see beyond the physical horizon. See the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God that is surely coming. And let us live in anticipation of that reality. Let us live with God's wisdom. Stand with me, will you please? Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he go before you and follow after you. May he guard you on your right and on your left. And may he fill you with his wisdom as you honor him in all your life. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit we pray. And everybody said, God bless you. Have a great week. God be with you each and every one.